Kath Woodward is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the Open University and has done lots of work on boxing and other sports. Kath, how are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. Fighting right. for Good. Good to talk to you. Um, so I first met you virtually. Uh, I, the first time I met your work was this book, Globalising Boxing. Um, and it's a very interesting book. Was that that wasn't the first book that you wrote? No, about, no. The Eye of the Tiger was the first one. The um, uh, um, boxing masculinity and identity, yeah. which um, which is the one. No, it was my first boxing book. I've written a lot of other stuff about boxing, but that was the first actual book. Which the, um, obvious, the obvious question then is, uh, well, there's several obvious questions. I'm going to go. Which came first, then, the sociology or the boxing for you? Boxing. Boxing Bo first. Way before I ever knew anything about sociology, I was a tiny, tiny child, and my dad used to listen to fights. From what he told me, was the garden in the middle of the night. Right. And uh, I used to go into my mum and dad's bedroom, and I, I knew it was something really exciting. And my dad was really keen on boxing. And uh, I used to go and listen to all this happening. I didn't know they were knocking hell out of each other, of course. I, you know, it just sounded exciting. And, and he always followed it. And it was the sort of great age of heavyweights and things. And yeah. boxing seemed such an exciting thing. Yeah. So, but as I grew up, this was a really tiny when, when this was happening, but dad always followed it. And I come from South Wales and boxing matters in South Wales quite a lot. It's a, a kind of route out, of, the traditional route out of poverty and, um, you know, for a lot of lads. So it's, um, it's got a tradition in the culture. But also, once I grew up a bit, I began to reflect on when I realised what it was people were doing. <laughs> You know, why would anybody do this and what sort of people were doing it? Um, why was it so full of heroes and, um, you know, in the narrative and things? So I think that's where the sociology came from. But, you know, boxing was in my life before sociology. Mm, I remember when I was a child, I remember I would sometimes listen to boxing matches on the radio in my yeah. late, because they're taking place in the States. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. You're, you're, you're really incredibly late listening to the boxing. That's right, middle of the night. Yeah, you know, and I remember my dad always said, he said, he used to listen to boxing. It always sounded like your guy was winning. And then he'd go, oh, yeah. he's, he's been knocked out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's also sudden, isn't it, you know? Yeah. But it, you do get that kind of visceral excitement of one-on-one um, of -on -one combat, really, it is. And they seem to be such massive people. I don't just mean heavyweights, you know, they seem to be such important people in, in, in our lives that uh, these stories about them. And sport's always been big in my life, you know, through so, my childhood. And so was your academic treatment of boxing, did it start out as a kind of trying to work out what you made of it all as a as a feminist as a scholar as a as a sociologist was it, is it was that what was it a working out for you or was it more than that no well i've, I've never i've never boxed you know i'm a i'm a real wimp i'm afraid uh but i've done a lot of sport but never boxing mm -hmm. but um when i um i've always i've wondered a bit about why i'm i so like boxing and it you know i'm probably the only one in my household who of sport fanatics who's actually keen on boxing mm -hmm. uh, but when it was in the mid 70s mid 90s mid 1990s we made a course at the Open University called Media Culture Identity uh, mm -hmm. with Stuart Hall and um, uh, we were making and I was writing about identity and I decided that my television contribution would be about bodies and identity way before the corporeal turn, but, yeah. um, uh, and um, everybody else was flying out to all manner of exciting places to make films for their uh, teaching module. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd like to go to a boxing gym. And that's how I first got friendly with Brendan Ingle, because I, I did two programs at, at the gym. And um, it was, it really made me stop and think and had an opportunity to articulate Firstly, what is it about boxing, about doing it? And secondly, what is it about watching it? You know, what makes people watch and the way people behave when they watch is so, is so different from how they might be in other situations. 
So it's, it's that bringing together of the inside and the outside, the psychosocial, and mm. it's also very political because it's about class, gender, race. It's about all the things that really matter to me as a sociologist. So that, that's, it was that moment in the 90s, actually, when um, we, we started, when I suggested this and Stuart encouraged me. So that's when I started actually reflecting on boxing rather than just feeling a bit uncomfortable about being following it. Okay. So, do, do you think there's anything specific to being a boxing fan, distinct from maybe other sports, maybe team sports? I don't know. Well, I'm a, a big cricket fan as well, which, you know, is perhaps they're very different. You know, mm. it's, cricket can be very slow or then, you know, can speed up. But um, I, I think there's, if you measure it in behavioural terms, yes, because you behave very differently at um, some sports than others. And boxing does generate a very particular kind of spectatorship. Uh, but I think there's still that investment, that kind of psychic investment that you have in the athlete from the point of view of the spectator. Mm -hmm. But I think some, boxing's very regulated, very disciplined, you know, martial arts are, are on the whole disciplined, perhaps not the ultimate fighting so much, but um, you know, the, a lot of um, combat sports are very disciplined. So I don't think it's about that so much. I think it's about how people feel about it. But boxing has got very powerful class and race associations and gender, mm. which is what I wrote about in the, in the first book. It was about masculinities, really, and about why people do it. <laughs> in, so uh, in, your, in your research, in your understanding of the situation, I mean, it's easy for us as academics to go, wow, there's, we're talking a lot about gender and class or yeah. even nation or, or, or whatever. Um, how far away from the surface of, of practitioner consciousness is that? It's easy for an academic to say this is all about class, but, or this is all about race even. But, but how far away is that in the, the, the speech and the thought patterns of, of boxers themselves or people in boxing gyms? Well, I think it, research into boxing has shown me it's a little bit, when you go quite a lot to the gym as a researcher, they start, you know, you start to use their language and they start to use yours <laughs> <clears throat> just a bit. But when I first went, I can remember asking, um, I asked Johnny Nelson how he felt about his body. And he looked at me and I thought, this is not the sort of question I should be asking him. He said, what do you mean? You know, oh, well, I've, I've had one or two injuries, you know, but he was only thinking in those terms. Yeah. And I was trying to elicit, you know, does this enhance your self-respect? And, you know, mm -hmm. how do you feel about it and things? But I think on the whole, um, I've met with some very funny looks when I've asked about the questions about social exclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't, wouldn't put it like that, but I think people are very defensive about it because the gym is a safe place on mm -hmm. the whole it's a physically challenging place but it's a safe place in terms of who you are and where you come from in yeah. in the gyms i've been to it's mostly though um illegal activity is not encouraged uh mm -hmm. so it's not so safe for that there's stuff that goes on around boxing you know yeah. that you don't you don't hear talked about very much actually in the gym and most trainers want to keep it out but otherwise it's a it's a safe place for people to go so they don't want to talk about being disadvantaged they just want to talk about uh how, how good they are or how bad they are or you know it's it's interesting because um most recently i was before the lockdown i was before the pandemic i was um train in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and the mm. way that Brazilian jiu-jitsu seems to express itself like the the, the the way it presents itself is one of of health often weight loss yeah, yeah. Um, I mean there's for me it was it wasn't about that at all I mean yeah it was but that wasn't my discord no, no. Um, so so do have you seen changes in the way that boxing has expressed itself like maybe a gym soul oh, yeah. or practitioners yeah. think about themselves I think the, the biggest shift has been in terms of um, women's participation and women do box for 
on the whole now for different reasons from those which you know the um kids boxed in whether in sheffield or in in the valleys you know it, it's um they were met they were boys and they were young men and they were doing it um perhaps sometimes because they'd been bullied and in the playground and the dad took them down the gym and you know to learn to defend yourself i think young women are doing it much more self-consciously in order to feel good about your body keep fit and um be be powerful through feeling good it's that kind of you know and in a much less about desperately wanting to get out of a situation which is intolerable mm. you know which is the migrant boxer and the um mm. uh you know that the the working class boxer was was often i i i heard some very sad stories from some of the you know the the kids i talked to when i went to the gym about turning pro and then not being able to you know anything would be better than being on welfare benefits but you mm. you know you turn pro and then you can't win any fights so mm. you're gonna have to go amateur again and you know those kind of things but i i think there's less of that now i think it is okay. much more framed by a, a discourse of well-being yeah kind of self-help self-improvement yeah. is there a kind of what someone like Martha McCoy would call like a physical feminism there that that women are going this yeah. is the women and girls are going I should be able to why well, can't I handle yeah. myself get a great workout yeah. and feel yeah confident. yeah 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 and actually I think um one of the things I looked at was um in the globalizing boxing was Muay Thai right. um and because um two of, my, two of my little grandchildren do that on a on a kind of um um, junior scale because <laughs> their dad does it and um, that I think was um, was very much the change from women participating because it's very patriarchal the culture yeah. of high boxing but it you know young women were just doing it for the set of body practices you know mm -hmm. that those embodied practices that they enjoyed engaging with and made them feel good and they rejected most of the rest of it the culture of um, you know the, the culture of boxing around it the culture of fighting and the and that kind of hierarchical culture and you know of course women weren't even allowed in the in, in the ring in muay thai which yeah. you know did didn't seem meaningful to them in a way that you know the um that it does in some of the training camps yeah so i, I think it's i think it is a challenge but it's not a radical you know banner waving shouting change it's an, um, a marginal incrementalism that's creative of a different way of thinking. Okay. And one of my biggest arguments in all the work I've done with sport is to suggest that it isn't, um, it's, it's the this, this sport doesn't just reflect social relations, it actually generates them. And yeah. I think that's the way in which those kind of little steps do make changes in how for example women see themselves and not just how they participate in combat sports and martial arts in mm -hmm. general or boxing but also in how they're they're shifting boxing but they're also shifting social attitudes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what and does that that i guess that happens at every level of the social from from women in combat sports women's boxing in the olympics to yeah we're going down well, to the club for women's anyone. boxing in the olympics you know from 2012 when it was first allowed mm -hmm. uh in the, the the way in which women's boxing was people commentated on it as a uh, as a serious sport there was no more of this you know ridiculous trivializing and talking about what they should be wearing and you know all this stuff about um uh was this ladylike or anything i mean it was all about the actual body practices in the ring and people like nicola adams really changed it i think mm. yeah, i was a bit I worried about where she went after but um when she turned pro but anyway she she did make a sh she produced a shift in consciousness to how people saw women yeah. engaging. I, it was the best thing that I saw in that Olympics. It was it was without yeah. doubt the best thing that yeah. I saw in the whole Olympics. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was. It was. So, she was <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, she 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 she's responsible for a lot. And similar kind of time you had Ronda Rousey uh, becoming yeah. famous in the UFC. Yeah. Um, 
you see, you really start to see, um, I mean, I did a bit of research a while back about uh, looking at newspaper stories about things like martial arts and combat sports. And it was really the, the 2012 Olympics and then, and then yeah. and Ronda Rousey, it was really all happened within the yeah. last decade, not yeah. all, but really yeah. hugely transformed since then, hasn't it? Yeah, it, it has. And I think um, it may not have made a huge difference sort of empirically, you know, in terms of because there was a lot of um, evaluation afterwards and saying, well, how many women are actually engaging in these sports and things? But I think it was more of a putting into discourse the idea that women could do it and they might do it. And it was, uh, you know, a part of a framework of choice. Mm -hmm. And also it was a, a cultural shift in how we saw femininity. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that kind of challenge to, um, to the idea. People used to ask me in the gym when I first went, well, you know, you've got kids, would you want your daughters to do it? And I said, well, I, I know my sons don't want to, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, you know, my, there's more chance that my daughters might, but people used to ask those questions yeah. and they don't ask those questions anymore. Yeah. You know, I think that's a, a shift across a cultural terrain rather than being just about how many people do it. Yeah. Although you've, it was popular after 2012, it did get popular. Yeah. You've written about a lot about time uh, to do with, 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 with different aspects as well. And also like the idea of problems of binaries. I guess you're kind of talking about non-binary non thinking there, aren't you? The way in which supposedly fixed binaries, yeah. they're not yeah. necessarily at all, are they? They're just, yeah. they're just there. We can just not use yeah. them. Well, I think the other thing about the, where thinking about temporality came into it was that idea of a continuum and time uh, which I got from I, I curated this exhibition at the Olympic Museum which you may know about and that was a, it was called Chasing Time but I looked at a lot of material on different sports for that but it really um, resonated with what I'd done on boxing because that seems to be so obviously timed there are the rounds and there is the time and then there's the counting out if you're not down but um, time, time loses a lot of that notion of it being start, finish, when you think about the, 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 the time in between, and that time in between, in between the start and the finish, is always, um, it's always part of a continuum, and the past, the present, and the future are always part of a conversation, I think, in sport. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're watching, you're always thinking, oh, he, Maybe you're thinking, say in boxing, thinking, well, he, 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 um, he won last time. You know, he's got to get it. He won in the third round last time. He's got to get it. And, and mm. you're thinking, and then you're thinking, oh, well, never mind. He'll be able to win his belt back next time. Or, you know, there's always that in the moment of now, you're always thinking about what happened last time or where it comes from and where it's going. Mm. So I think that's one element of it, challenging binaries as well. And the start finish one, because you're immersed in the moment. And in the um, Sporting Times, I wrote about the 2012 Olympics, actually, and it was written more or less in the time of the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of um, the Usain Bolt of, um, of academe, I felt I was with them. Um, but that was about being lost in time. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, we measure it with clocks. Yeah. But, you know, it's um, time can, when you're in the zone, you're out of time you're... it's a bit like now isn't it with the uh, with with the pandemic and the the lockdowns and the supposed easing of lockdowns i found that if i knew for certain i would be back training again in september or i could go that would be a, such a, a, a massive uh, it would enable me yeah to to act but like because i don't know anything about the future really Mm. And I don't trust the government and I don't trust the, you know, no. the, the scientists are saying a completely different thing to the government. It's, it's like that, that frustration of time, the confusion of, well, when is the next time? Yeah. And my identity is just, it's almost like I'm on pause. Like, do I do martial yeah. arts? Do I yeah. train? Like, well, who am I, you know? Well, I, I think that's partly too because of the way in which th this discourse has been established for us in terms of uh, how it's been set, those ideas, that throughout the, the um, coronavirus experience, the, throughout the pandemic, we've had briefings at a certain time, and we've had men in suits and a few women telling us that um, this, is the, this is measurable, 
we had the number of dead people and then the number of um, tests and and it's all about quantifiable factors and so it's hardly surprising that we are all trapped in this thing about well when's it going to end mm. you know this is when it started and we're in day this day that and you know we want an end and we think as human beings that we can control it mm -hmm. and um we don't seem able to control it actually at the moment anyway we don't seem able to control it so i think that is about that's one of the big things about time is that we keep we've developed incredibly sophisticated ways of measuring time mm -hmm. and it gives us the notion as human beings that we can control it mm -hmm. and we don't we we can't uh mm -hmm. but we can't admit that so mm -hmm. that that's part of our frustration just, i think just thinking about time and control and I mean, I've, I, I don't know if you might not have read it yet, but the, the latest article by Alex Chan, and he talks about Edgeworth, the concept of Edgeworth and the way oh, yeah. In, yeah. in which we, we want to take ourselves to an edge. So like, for instance, yeah. I've, al I've always liked sparring. I've always liked yeah. challenging myself against someone, even if I know they're going to beat the hell out of me, because I know it's for a limited duration. They're probably yeah. not going to try and kill me, but I want to push myself but I wouldn't go like on a motorbike or I wouldn't skydive or I wouldn't yeah. climb the mountain or something because it's like for me there is that like desire to control but also to push a little bit further and I think things like boxing kickboxing and any kind of sparring mm. have got that for me they it's really safe yeah and fighting and well it is your body as well I think that it's it's well and you've also trained so it's not whereas you probably haven't for skydiving you know you you know so so it would be a bit bit dodgy <laughs> to try that yeah. but yeah i mean you've trained but i think the other thing about boxing is that it's the sort of the flesh fighting back it's the last bastion well you, you gloves and things well except you know you don't always but um it, it, you don't require it's a, that argument is always used for or you don't require expensive equipment and things. And I know now elite boxers do have, you know, pretty mm. good gloves and things. But on the whole, it's just your body. That's, mm. that's all there is. So in a way, I think the idea that one has some control over one's own body is mm. a very, very strong urge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a really strong feeling that you want, like you want to control what happens to your body. Uh, that's why this virus is so scary, you know, that we, we have no way of, of, um, of controlling it. Well, limited ways of controlling it. But I, I think that's why, that's the thing about boxing or, or martial arts is that, um, that the body is, um, we, we live in a highly technological time when we resort to expertise and technology to rescue us. But fighting is about you and what you can do so maybe there is a sense in which you know it's up to you then yeah the, the other point you make about the edge i think that um that applies to spectatorship as well because people who watch boxing are always thinking what if they're thinking what if there's some terrible damage and they're shouting for for a knockout and when you think what a knockout is mm. you know it's should we be shouting for this and the other thing i think is people are thinking what if I was doing that? Yeah. And they're actually, well, the spectators are probably too fat, too, <laughs> too frightened. <laughs> but, There's nothing, know, nothing more amusing than I, I wouldn't have done that kind of discourse about yeah. <laughs> anything. Ah, yeah. oh, yes, yes. Well, that's, oh, that's yeah. pretty pervasive in sport, isn't it? You know, uh, the expert on the bench and the expert in the stands, yeah. But I think with boxing, there is the, the what if of something violent and there is that um attraction of repulsion you know we f we feel shocked if somebody's knocked out and mm -hmm. some of the scenes in boxing rings have been pretty awful mm -hmm. which you know you think well why would anybody want to to mm -hmm. go on to engage with that or watch it mm -hmm. but i think there is the thing of you know being on the edge and pushing it as far as it'll go Mm -hmm. So that that's certainly an element of it, and and the excitement, I suppose, whether yeah. you're the practitioner or the spectator. And you've written. I was reading through um, your one of your online profile things, um, and some work that I haven't read of yours. Uh, it seems to be about the concept of being in the zone. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, I really want to read. I'm gonna when I when we finish talking, I'm probably gonna order that or find it. But well, tell me about that. 
well, I, I wrote about boxing in in the in the collection of books that I did with um, with Tim Jordan uh, mm. about uh, of chapters, sorry, about um, uh, uh, being in the zone mm. because the zone came out partly from the work on time and temporality. You know, this idea that time is um, it, although you can technically measure it, there are moments when uh, of peak performance, for example, when you you're you you're not cognizant of time at all it just you know it isn't there and so we put together this collection and the way in which i think it works in um in boxing is the way in which one is so lost in that moment you don't actually it's you don't actually have to be all that elite you know you can be fairly ordinary and be in the zone mm -hmm. uh but it's a moment when you, you don't stop to think about, you know, your mind and body are one and you don't stop to think about it and you are on a roll, you know, but you are immersed in the moment and lost in the moment. And I think in boxing, it's so apparent because people are, uh, must be in pain and yet they don't seem to be aware of that. I know you can explain it around adrenaline, but I, I think there's more to it than that. There's, there's, mm -hmm. There's more to it in terms of this. If you've been in the zone, you know it. Yeah, I think you can. You can get the, there's some types of sparring that aren't. I'm not thinking of boxing here. That really encourage that for they encourage that 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 frame of being, that frame of mind. Such as in Tai Chi, you have push hands, which is mm. all, which is literally. It's like I'm thinking about flow state. It's literally yeah. learning yes. that flow. Yeah. Um, and also, think, sometimes yeah. you, don't, you don't have to be sparring a person. You can be on a punch bag. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can be yeah. skipping. You could yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Funny, yeah. You could be jogging. I guess that you, you know. Well, you could be actually running through the fields. Mm -hmm. You could be a small child who's just lost in the wonder of this moment, running across a field with um, dogs, which mm -hmm. is my predilection. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> So do you, do you, is there much reference to the, to the, the psychological concept of flow? Yeah, so are you the, trying to think more in a kind of sort of a Burton, Merleau-Ponty kind of a way? Or? Well, it's more Merleau-Ponty than Csikszentmihalyi, but we've, we've gone on beyond that, I think, uh, okay. to, to frame it particularly in terms of time and mm. of ter in terms of, um, of challenging conventional hierarchical structures, because you, you can get apps to get you into the zone and employers like this idea, you mm -hmm. know, of, of getting people to, um, uh, to, to behave rather like automata and to, um, you know, to, to, to be more productive. But I think what we've tried to look at and I've tried to look at in boxing is that this is actually something which is creative and it's also democratic. The zone is democratic. And what's happened in those sports where women have been denied access which they have until fairly recently historically in boxing, um, women haven't had the chance to, to gain access to this state. So mm. it, it is, a, when, I think my view of it is a bit more political and a bit more um, imaginative than um, the Csikszentmihalyi, which is very clearly stages, you know, mm. of flow that there's, um, you know, the, the different stages that you go through and it's very much psychological. But I think it's especially as illustrated by boxing, it's corporeal, it's mm -hmm. enfleshed in a way. Mm -hmm. It's not just psychological states and you can't differentiate between mind and body mm -hmm. and you can't in boxing. Mm -hmm. So, which is near a Merleau-Ponty. Right? So, so if people are, if say, I don't know, if, if we're talking about women, if they're, if they're not included in this or they're not able to do this, then they're denied a realm of experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. that, that, that yeah. could empower yeah. them in different ways. Or... Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's also about pleasure. We mm -hmm. don't often talk about pleasure, so we don't get much of it now in, this, in these times. Um, but actually, it's, um, it, it is a state of joy, you mm -hmm. know, and I think um, uninhibited by some of those conventions. But you obviously need to train. You're not going to get into the zone if you have no competence yeah. at all. Yeah. But, it's, Sorry, it's, <laughs> you're wondering whether you can do it. No, no, I'm think I'm thinking of something else because um, recently, because uh, I mean, I've 
I've always exercised. I've always had something on the go. But my wife has recently started to, to, to jog and she's, yeah. she claims she doesn't like, she's going, when's this endorphin thing going to happen? When's this high? <laughs> and I was thinking about this um, yesterday because, you know, I think that exercise is the only high that, that you can get stronger and stronger. So, you know, they say like, if you're addicted to tobacco or heroin, yeah. Yeah. You need more and more to get the same yeah. with exercise. I could do any tiny amount of exercise and I can feel it straight away. Like yeah. straight away. I feel yes. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm more alive. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I think there's, there's one argument that this is, this is often associated with being outside. Mm. you know rather than in um in the gym which is i mm. i think the boxing gym is rather different actually from um from the kind of gyms that people go to to um to work out mm -hmm. uh but you know because the boxing gym is is a, a community it isn't as individualized as you know as, as mm. um the, the kind of health club gyms but mm. um and there's quite a lot of evidence that actually this kind of donna haraway writes about um this way in which she's keen on dogs too, uh, running with dogs and doing agility training and things. And, uh, and that there is a moment when you and the dog are, um, are, are one and you're, you and the place where you are outside, that is, you know, running outside. I must say, when I get up very early in the morning with chickens and dogs and I don't want to get out of my bed and I, I, I hate it, but once I'm outside, Mm -hmm. Even if I'm in my pajamas, I feel if the well, if it's not too wet, but like this morning, I I I get a yeah, I get a high actually <laughs> being out there in the and we run down the garden, you know it's um it, well it's a small scale, but I wouldn't go as far as the zone actually at that time in the morning, but um it certainly is something which you get from moving, you know from from actually engaging in something physical. Yeah, there's so many dimensions that we that get yeah. sens they get censored from discourse don't they when, yeah. when you have to talk about something in a certain way whether it's in terms of success or achievement or discipline yeah. i've got to yeah. well, actually it, there's there's just pleasure there are sensations the cold yeah. air on your skin yeah you know, yeah into your lungs there's the, the you know running on the grass or yeah. whatever it is yeah uh, that yeah. You, you can't quantify that no it's what irigarai calls resence, you know, that yeah. kind of, um, which babies get, you know, but, uh, but I think in sport, uh, there is the idea that you need some level of competence to get there. But there is definitely that pleasure, which is temporal in that it's atemporal. You're in the moment. Mm -hmm. You're just being there. You're not, you're not anything else, you know, mm -hmm. and you're not thinking functionally you're not thinking teleologically and that's what's happened with sport it's always about um well you could improve you could um uh enhance your performance if mm. you know if you if you do this training but some things are just good in themselves and maybe that's something we need to get back to rather than just chasing targets mm. people, so people in the gym just spar they go on yeah. and on doing it yeah, uh, yeah, that 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 would be a good deal. Um, um, so in terms of pleasure, then, which dimension of boxing do you think gives would you would prioritize? Is it the 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 gym life? Is it the spectatorship? Is it watching it on a on a big screen? Is it watching it in a, in a club? I mean, which which is the which would be the thing you would choose if you had to choose a dimension of boxing? Mm, that that they're so different all those things because i think i think i'd go for the gym hmm. because although i'm not a practitioner in the gym but i you know i've hung about there and um i got to the point i've written about that this being i'm clearly an outsider you know because i i don't fit in in any way but i've i've been i've always been treated as an insider well a sort of insider kind of figure and i think i think there is in that situation well there's pain but pe pe pleasure and pain go very closely together but it's not it's not manufactured there's a sense of collective enterprise in a way that unless there is a the occasional real fight which i have experienced 
okay. not myself, but yeah. <laughs> been there um, when people fall out. But um, on the whole, that that is a, um, a collective, and I think that's the thing about the zone is that you can have a good a good session, a good day, and the that there's a great deal of pleasure in that in that community and the collective being in the zone. Whereas, yeah, spectatorship can be um, it, it's it's a bit combative the spectatorship I think because there are there are the spectatorship is also manufactured especially now in boxing because there's a huge razzmatazz around it often with big fights anyway there's mm -hmm. there's and it feels manufactured and it takes you away from the the sort of grassroots level uh, but I I do think there are so many different elements in that you know that what happens at the elite level influences what happens in the gym enormously so it's you know you can't really disentangle them but i do think the gyms where the the greatest pleasure might be okay um and we you know things have have changed over the decades in both in terms yeah. of academic work and in terms of boxing and in terms of the media society we live in the media culture um i remember when i i think yours was the the Globalizing Boxing was the second boxing book that I read. The first one I read was uh, Louis Wacant's book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember, I mean, I thought that was a, a great book because it was, it was all fresh and new to me, that the, yeah. the way that he was using Bourdieu's concepts yeah. and so on. But you seem to be quite critical of that. You didn't really seem to write. Well, no. I mean, so, what, yeah. what, so the question I want to ask is, which are your, which do you think are the best sorts of concepts or fields or theories or, or academic languages that you would use when you were talking about gym life and you're talking about training and, and training to be a boxer? Well, I think my only criticism of Louis Vacant is his, um, his failure to acknowledge his own privilege, you know, as a, a white man in the gym and that um, he, in, in um, Body and Soul, I think he mentions it once that he's come from the university, but of course he's so special that everybody accepts him and things. You know, I think uh, that was my point of criticism, but I do think that um, developments of Merleau-Ponty, especially Iris Marion Young uh, and Toral Moy, I think are, um, <clears throat> are, are really good at um, offering an explanation of how body practices work and how different body practices work, especially in relation to um, uh, to gender. Uh, I mean, I, th I think there are, you know, there are other the the great boxing books about. Um, in, you can't get much better than Mike Marcusy on you know on on Ali and those books about race and things. I think are, are are wonderful, but they're they're not they don't really engage explicitly with the academic literature. Mm -hmm. But I think feminism has a great deal to offer. Critical race theory and feminism have a great deal to offer in terms of um, of looking at the um, as well as Bourdieu. No, I, I wouldn't reject Bourdieu. I was just I didn't dare to criticize Vacan actually because he's you know he's he's not all that easy if you do. <laughs> but um, it was just that I think I think one needs to show respect for the people in the gym, and I think that's one of the things as academics that you know it's not it's not i'm not just an outsider because i'm uh, i'm the wrong a age and sex and things for have been over the years for it but it's also because um we have pretty privileged lives and we need to show respect for people who put their bodies on the line <clears throat> in this way and i think participating maybe gives you more of that respect but I think you have to show that respect, which means acknowledging difference mm -hmm. and maybe distance. But no, that there's, um, I've always been quite eclectic in the way I've, you know, I've, um, in what I've looked at and what I've, <laughs> you know, what, what I've used and what I've done. Okay. Uh, so, um, I guess the question now we can ask about the future. I mean, are you, have you got any more boxing works in the pipeline? Or are you looking at other sports or other cultural and social activities? Well, I'm, I've got, I've just written a book about birth and death, which you may, may have seen. And I'm about to do the fourth edition of the, um, uh, the big issues, <clears throat> which I'm going to do. I did football in that, but I'm going to do boxing in that 
the next time. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of boxing, I think my, my it, boxing's the sport I most want to write about because I think boxing has been so influential in my life in shaping what, how, how I think. And it's led to the kind of feminist critiques that I've used and things, mm -hmm. which may seem a bit contradictory. But I think I want to look more in terms of, because I think my days of ethnography are, um, are over, actually. So, and well, all, for all of us, they're over at the moment, aren't they? <clears throat> but um, I, I think I, what I'm looking at more is the kind of, the way in which social change has taken place in how boxing and, and different martial arts actually are configured in contemporary culture since 2012, in very recent times actually, and drawing on the different components that I've been looking at to look at cultural change. That's, the, that's where I'm going. Mm, okay, cool. And then finally, I guess, um, we were chatting a bit on, online, weren't we, about, about where we are with with the world and and the present mm. yeah and i guess the, we can't I mean, think about, any... about big, big configurations of things since 2012 i mean we must be going through a huge reconfiguration of the the, the sporting the participation the practice mm. of things like boxing and, and combat sports and martial arts i mean what what where do you think where do you think we're going with that i mean what, well what can you, what I... can you imagine I'm really, really worried about it because, I mean, the argument has always been that, you know, boxing, martial arts are, um, are corporeal, enfleshed, and a lot of the, you know, the theorizing I've done has been around bodies and selves. And <clears throat> now this is the, the major negative aspect of it, you know, post-pandemic. We're not post-pandemic yet, are we? We're still pandemic. So I feel, I feel very anxious about it and how we will, what I fear will happen is that we'll still have, like with football and cricket, mm. you know, the, the elite athletes, the players will be tested, tested in you know, the morning, noon and night, and they will be able to compete. Mm. But you won't have, you won't have spectators and you won't have the community possibilities that you now have. I, I think it might be, Unless we get, you see, this is why you're thinking, you're hoping for something to happen so that that is the way back. So, you know, I, but I, we've always managed before. Yeah. You think about the history of, well, it's boxing I know most about, the circumstances under which people have had boxing clubs. And um, it came back after the plague. Well, it, it arrived after the plague. So maybe we'll, um, <clears throat> you know, we'll be able to maintain it. I think boxing is always punching against the odds. So I think we'll be able to get back. Okay, well, on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much, Kath. That was, okay. it was really lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. <laughs>